Okay, and I'll go ahead and get us started. So welcome everybody, thank you. We've had a little bit of a hiatus from Tika Talks, but we are back today and we are going to hear from uh, the recently minted Dr. Timothy Collins. He recently uh, completed his PhD in 2020 at the University of New England. And now he is a senior scientist with the New South Wales government. And he is going today to talk to us about these beautiful Nephalae and I will let you take it away. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, yeah, and thanks um, to Alexander and Carolina for the, uh, the opportunity to, to get involved in and present today. Um, before I start, I, I guess I'd like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which I'm presenting, the Ngunnawal here in Canberra, Australia. And uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to uh, traditional owners who may be listening uh, around Australia or even around the world. So today I'm uh, presenting uh, results, as Jennifer said, of, from my uh, PhD project, uh, which focused on the um, Australian endemic uh, genera and one uh, orphan species of helichrysum. So uh, Xerochrysum coronidium and helichrysum leucopsidium. Um, I was really fortunate in the uh, project to um, be uh, um, both amply and ably supervised um, by uh, Alexander, Ian Telford, Rose Andrew and Jeremy Brühl. Um, the PhD was done, at, as Jennifer said, at the University of New England and co-supervised with Alexander at the CSIRO uh, here in Canberra. So I guess uh, the background to, to this project uh, was um, work that, um, that Alexander led um, that was looking at um, what, what was termed, you know, some of the orphan species of helichrysum in Australia. So as we know now, um, Australian uh, Nephalae uh, form a, a clade in the, uh, and uh, that are largely endemic to Australia. Um, and it's now recognized that the genus Helichrysum um, is probably confined to Southern Europe and North Africa and, and species that had been included in Helichrysum from Australia uh, were probably misplaced there, were definitely misplaced there. And, and, um, and certainly there's a lot of work now going on to try to, um, try to understand uh, where those uh, orphan species of helichrysum that still remain in Australia. I think there's, well, when Alexander did this study, I think there were eight and now I think there's, there's four remaining still to be, still to be uh, worked out. Um, so in this, uh, in this uh, study that set up um, the premise for my PhD, uh, a phylogeny was produced that showed that um, the genus Coronidium, which was described by Paul Wilson in, in 2008, uh, was non-monophyletic and formed um, Four, four different clades. We can see here there's a, they were termed um, the Coronidium elatum group one. And you can see on the right here some examples of, of, the, uh, of these genera. So um, was, I guess I was lucky in that uh, in Nephalia, these were quite um, pretty and spectacular um, examples in Nephalia. I wasn't working on the cud weeds, for example, although that would be still very interesting. Um, so in Xerochrysum, you know, they're the golden everlastings, the straw flowers. Um, they're probably uh, one of Australia's uh, most widely grown uh, groups of plants or species around the world. They've been uh, grown around the world for hundreds of years now. And, um, but closely related is this uh, Coronadium elatum group one, which um, Alexander et al identified um, as a separate clade to the Oxalipus group, which contains the type for the genus Coronidium. 
Um, interesting, this Elatum group, which, which had been recognised by Paul Wilson when he described the genus in 2008, um, uh, separated out into two, two different uh, clades um, that weren't sister to each other. Um, and what uh, has been known as the Coronidium scorpioides group, which started as a single species Coronidium scorpioides and then has since been uh, recognised as, as uh, multiple species, um, is, was found to be not really uh, closely related to Coronidium at all and perhaps um, uh, much more closely related to, to Chrysocephalum, um, which is another a really interesting genus of Australian endemic Nephalae. So, um, my understanding of how this all happened was that uh, Alexander uh, spoke to his co-authors and said, this, is, this needs to be resolved. Um, let's get some money and find a student. I was um, the uh, lucky fellow who was in the right place at the right time. And, and, um, and so I took this on. Um, in terms of my PhD project, the, um, the study group can be sort of identified here at, at A on the on the phylogeny, which, so it includes essentially xerochrysum and these three clades of coronidium. We didn't include the scorpioides group um, because it was really regarded as perhaps a bit uh, too distant from uh, xerochrysum and would essentially just make the project uh, too large to, to handle in a, in a three year PhD study. So a bit of a summary here on the left, uh, this uh, coronidium uh, currently consists of 19 species and six subspecies uh, confined to the east coast of Australia, uh, whereas xerochrysum, uh, which is currently uh, 13 species, can be found right across Australia. Uh, with the majority of the species found on the east coast, but species occurring up in the tropical north uh, of the Northern Territory and Kimberley region, as well as uh, through Central Australian deserts and down to the far southwest of Western Australia. Um, the genus that we currently call, well, the, the genus Xerochrysum has had um, has a bit of a convoluted history. It was, it was, uh, it was the first species um, which we now know, Xerochrysum bracteatum, was, was first uh, described by uh, Vontenar, the French botanist, uh, from the garden of the Empress Josephine at Malmaison. And he placed it uh, in, the, in the genus Xeranthemum. But Andrews quickly recognised that uh, it wasn't, shouldn't really be part of Xeranthemum and transferred it to Helichrysum. Um, Bentham in 1867, um, looked, did a revision as part of uh, Flora Australiensis and uh, sitting there in, uh, in uh, London with um, a number of specimens from right across Australia and, 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 and uh, seeing a lot of morphological variation, he described, he lumped most of the uh, described species into, into, hel into, into one, into Helichrysum bracteatum. Um, Anderberg and Hagee um, recognised that um, these things from Australia weren't part, shouldn't be part of helichrysum at all. They particularly they uh, noted um, the uh, large and um, hairless um, uh, cypsulae, and um, and they erected the the uh, genus Bracteantha in 1991. Uh, unfortunately, in 1990, a Russian uh, botanist, Ze Zelev, I always struggle to pronounce that one, um, had, uh, had, had already described Xerochrysum bracteatum. He'd, he'd come to the same conclusion a year earlier. And so uh, bracteantha became superfluous. Um, Wilson described coronidium from, uh, to, to, uh, to include species that had been in helichrysum. And in, in 2017, Wilson did a partial, partial revision of the genus describing four new species, um, but also recognizing that there were um, a number of um, unresolved um, taxonomic issues, in particular morphological variation that he uh, wasn't able to, to cover in that partial revision. And that's where I came along.
So um, in Australia, we, we recognize um, potential new tax or new entities, and we, and we call them phrase names. In New Zealand, I think they call them tag names. Um, and um, we have an Australian plant census that's maintained by, um, by the CSIRO here in Canberra. And um, when I started uh, the project there, there were um, seven um, phrase name species that uh, had been recognized by Herbaria around Australia as potentially being new entities, but which had, um, had not been um, studied or described. So um, we can see in the photos here, we can see a photo of a, a cultivated Xerochrysum uh, bracteatum. Um, I was fortunate in that I, I came to this project uh, with the past having worked in, in nurseries as a plant propagator. And, and so propagating plants and growing things in pots uh, is something I've done quite a bit. And I, and I really uh, went to town on this one because we timed our field work to collect uh, uh, fruits as well, and I was able to to cultivate um, almost all of the uh, all of the entities that I worked on from from most of the populations. But um, look, the purpose of this uh, photos here are really to sort of show that um, that uh, what we call what we were calling Xerochrysum bracteatum at the start of this project included things like like this plant here, which um, which was uh, grown from seed collected on. Uh, St. Helena, which is an island in the um, South Atlantic Ocean where Napoleon Bonaparte was exiled. And um, I'll return to that story in a little bit, but we were able to get some, some fruits and leaf samples from St. Helena. And I was able to, to germinate them and grow them in the glass house in Harmerdale. And um, we can see the, the plants from St. Helena and we can compare that to some of the couple of the phrase name entities, uh, this Xerochrysum but Glencoe, which, which grows on the uh, northern tablelands of New South Wales, the, the New England bioregion for which the University of New England's named. Um, it's, a, it's a sort of a high, a high altitude, high altitude for Australia. So it's about, you know, rises from about 700 metres to 1400 metres above sea level. And um, it's largely comprised of, you know, granite basaltic soils, lots of grassy open woodlands. Um, and, and this Xerochrysum spurt Glencoe is a really spectacular um, paper daisy that grows, on, grows there and, um, and has a number of morphological differences to what uh, we might call Xerochrysum bracteatum. Um, another one of the phrase name species, this uh, Xerochrysum bracteatum spurt North Stradbroke Island, has been uh, has been recognised as a as a potential new species since the 1970s, um, and we can see it here growing. Uh, in it typically grows on uh, grassy headlands on the east coast of Australia, where it's a very compact um, plant. This um, this phrase name entity has been um, also been grown um, and sold in pots as a horticultural thing under the name of um, Xerochrysum diamond head, or it was probably, you know, Helichrysum diamond head, Bracteantha diamond head, uh, but it's been sold as, a, as, as if it was a cultivar um, through nurseries for quite a number of years. And, and certainly these, uh, you know, these morphological differences and, and particularly as well, I suppose, uh, plants growing in re really different habitats, you know, from, you know, over a thousand metres sea level with uh, these beautiful bouquets of, of uh, inflorescences on single stems to these compact forms on coastal headlands. And then Bracteae atom typically in the margins of, of forests um, down around Sydney really uh, raises the question about, you know, what, what, what sort of biological diversity uh, have we got here? Here and and uh, and how do we uh, try to uh, come to grips with it and describe it? So um, I might have mentioned before I was able to um, to do this project with the assistance of a grant that my supervisor had had uh, obtained, and and the grant provided um, the resources to do 
uh, molecular work um, and and field work. And um, certainly, you know, as um, somebody tooling around at the, at the end of my honours, the prospect of doing some field work was um, was was really appealing to me. So we can see here um, the uh, the locations of um, the samples that I used. Uh, in the project, and and I'm happy to say that most of these locations I was actually able to get to. So um, pretty much most of 2018 was spent organising field trips and and travelling around the country. And I thought, look, for an international audience, it might be worthwhile um, sort of showing a little bit of this, um, partly to to gloat and say how lucky am I, but also to sort of um, dis. To, to try to um, communicate the, um, the diversity of habitats that these, um, that these plants can be found in. Um, so look, I, I guess the, the first field trip I did was with Alexander and, and um, I should say that, um, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a quarter to five in the morning here in, in Canberra. And it was a similar time when I met Alexander for the first time um, to go on a, a field trip to, um, to uh, Kangaroo Island in South Australia. And on the, uh, might have even been the first day, we were able to find um, uh, these um, xerocrysum growing on uh, limestone cliffs above the, above the sea here in South Australia. Um, the field trip also took us on the mainland up north into the Flinders Ranges, which is a much drier um, uh, sort of habitat. It's sort of semi-arid. Um, you can see in the photo here, you know, some of the, you know, classic Australian flora, grass trees in the genus Xanthorea. And then I think there's a, there's a bunch of casuarinas and colitris um, in the background as well. So that's, that was down here in, in South Australia, Kangaroo Island and up to the Flinders Ranges. Um, I should say that I was also able to access samples from, from other organisations. And so I was able to get some samples of, from, from outside or from areas where I didn't actually get to go. So there were a couple of spots here and in Victoria, some of this stuff in Central Australia, but but everywhere else was, was able to go. Um, the next trip was um, was down to um, the island of Tasmania, which um, is off the, uh, the southern coast of the mainland here. It's a, it's a continental island, um, lots of endemic species. And um, with my supervisor, Rose Andrew, we, we were able to go and visit and um, always love to take a selfie. Here I am at um, Cradle Mountain, which is in Lake St. Clair National Park. And, and this um, part of Tasmania is um, just really fascinating, these alpine zones. In, um, in the scope of this photo, where Rose and I were able to collect um, four species of xerocrysum, um, three of which are endemic to the island of Tasmania. And, um, and so it was really important to get things like that to, to really understand uh, uh, particularly um, phylogenetic relationships later on in the study. Um, and so um, one, one area that, um, that uh, you can sort of see that a lot of the focus was on this east coast because that's where most of the species currently described are. And it's also where uh, many of these phrase name or, or taxonomically uncertain uh, entities were as well. So Queensland, um, this state in the in the north northeast of, of Australia is a massive area, um, and um, and certainly um, it's got a huge variety of habitats. So um, in the southeast, uh, Morton Island, you know, it's like a forty minute um, ferry ride from um, the capital of Queensland, Brisbane, and um, we stepped onto the sandy shores of Morton Island. Um, li literally following in the uh, footsteps of um, Alan Cunningham and um, Ferdinand von Mueller. And uh, I'm really happy to say that we found these xerocrysum. So these, these are uh, what would um, are currently also called this um, xerocrysum North Stradbroke Island that might, you know, more typically can be found on grassy headlands. We saw the photos earlier, but here it's on the, on the literally on the four dunes um, of, of the beach. Um, the Atherton Tablelands, on the other hand, is much further north up uh, near Cairns in far north Queensland. So, you know, a couple of thousand kilometres north <clears throat> where um, we're in the tropics and we go up onto the Atherton Tablelands and we've got grassy woodlands of eucalyptus. 
Um, and, and underneath the eucalyptus, we've got these uh, erect um, xerochrysum bracteatum in the broad sense. Um, now, um, I was also very fortunate to get to go to the top end of the Northern Territory, the far Northern end of the Territory. I did live for a number of years in, in Central Australia and, um, and so I was able to, uh, to get a whole bunch of uh, collections from there using my, my, uh, my social networks. Um, but, um, you know, Northern Territory, the top end, you know, it's the land of Crocodile Dundee, um, it's a, a really fascinating um, place where uh, Aboriginal culture has been um, uh, really uh, been able to uh, survive a lot of the effects of colonisation. Um, we were up there in um, what's called the build-up, so October, so it's the it's a, it's the wet, dry tropics, and um, you know um, you look at this. I, the photo I took this it was probably 38 degrees um, Celsius, and um, and you know, 80% humidity, <laughs> so it was hot. <laughs> um, so that's this region up here, and um, that um, that sandstone you can see there it, um, forms a, a quite a large area in here. And I was really fascinated by the by the distribution of these collections. You know, the historical collections. People have been picking these things up, and they'd collected them either side of this sandstone uh, plateau. And I was really interested to see if we could test whether um, there was, uh, you know, some um, biophysical barriers to gene flow here and potentially we might be sort of seeing that, um, you know, that there was preventions to gene flow isolation and possibility of, uh, of speciation occurring. So came, really keen to, to, to test that. And so we went to quite a bit of effort to, to make sure we got those collections up there. Um, Western Australia. Uh, was next. It takes up nearly half of, of Australia. It's uh, absolutely enormous. Um, we were fortunate um, to be able to get a bit of extra funding, grant funding to do a, a three-day trip from Armadale, which is here on the northern tablelands in northern New South Wales, and, um, and fly to Perth and then up to, to Newman in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. This is where um, China gets most of its um, iron ore from. And there were records here of uh, what Paul Wilson had described as xerochrysum interiori. You can sort of see these disjunct populations. And we were like, that's, that's a really interesting spot. The Pilbara is known as a bi biodiversity hotspot, um, possibly because of the, uh, the amount of work that goes into um, doing environmental impact statements for massive iron ore mines. They keep finding things up there. Um, that might just be because they're looking. Um, but yeah, we, are, we were interested to sort of see whether this was, was uh, something new or, or just uh, perhaps um, something that sort of said, you know, not a lot of collecting done in these um, remote arid uh, areas of Western Australia. There are some records that occur across here, but not much into Western Australia. And um, it could just be a case of under collecting or is it something new in the, from the biodiversity hotspot? So we went to Western Australia. Um, we went to the Pilbara, but also down in the southwest of Western Australia, there's, um, there's, there's this species Xerochrysum macranthum um, that's common around Perth and the coastal plain. And then when I was down uh, in the far southwest, which is, yes, another biodiversity hotspot, um, I picked up a number of things that I, I put some tag names on to test to test their entities, because on the coastal plain we get um, we get xerochrysum hiding in here amongst the amongst the shrubbery under uh, eucalypts in these forests and um, and woodlands, but down on the on these uh, you know the Stirling Ranges and Purungarup Range, we get um, we get uh, something with uh, larger leaves um, and uh, a perennial life life cycle, whereas on the coastal plain, it's annual. We get these perennials up on the mountain tops. Um, and, uh, and I was really keen to, to see if we could uh, f find some evidence that there was um, undescribed biodiversity there. So Western Australia had a lot of fun traveling there and, um, and making lots of collections. Um, Shouldn't um, really uh, neglect my home state of New South Wales because that's where the university is and where um, 
many of the uh, phrase name entities occurred. Um, I don't expect you to go and read through all of this uh, stuff. It will be uh, coming out shortly in a paper in uh, Australian Systematic Botany, and I'm sure you'll all enjoy reading it then. Um, but you can sort of see that there was there was a lot of phrase name entities. There was a lot of sort of, uh, I guess, taxonomic questions we wanted to answer. Um, and it's kind of illustrated by, you know, the fact that I've, I've highlighted different things in colours here. Um, but in New South Wales, um, it's where, um, you know, Xerochrysum bracteatum <clears throat> um, was uh, thought to be first collected and, and taken to the gardens at Malmaison. And, uh, and here I found it on the, on the south coast of New South Wales, um, down uh, near the, uh, the National Park, Mount, uh, Mount Dromedary, Dromedary, which is now Gulaga National Park. It's been renamed for the uh, traditional Aboriginal name. And here you can sort of see um, Xerochrysum bracteatum growing in somewhat weedy location with Lantana camara. And, you know, I think there's Bidens in here, but there's also um, um, indigenous acacias, um, prostantheras, zyerias, things like that growing here as well. You can see in the background that um, it's an area of rich volcanic soils. And so it has been uh, largely cleared for, for dairying in that part of the world. Anyway, so let's keep moving along. Um, as I mentioned, I was able to, um, to do a lot of plant propagation and, and I just thought I'd chuck this in here. Um, we can see that, um, you know, when uh, Vontana described Xerochrysum bracteatum from Malmaison in 1803, um, the, the French uh, artist Pierre-Joseph Rute um, did that wonderful painting. I grew these plants um, at, at UNE in Armadale from, from the seeds uh, from uh, St. Helena. And in the, in the gloom of the corridor of the botany building, you can almost get a sense of Redoute there. Um, so yeah, I thought I'd just chuck that in there because it's kind of funny. Um, but you can see that um, in terms of uh, morphology, you, you know, the plants from St. Helena certainly appear very similar to the, the painting by Redoute, which I thought was kind of cute. Um, so <clears throat> I guess um, getting back to the taxonomy in Bentham in, um, in uh, 1867, you know, he came up with this broad concept of bracteatum and, you know, as a, as a, hot-headed student I was like how did he do this he sank all these species he looked at it and he said oh you know this is too hard I'm going to put what what Seba and and Springle were calling Helichrysum viscosum I'm going to lump that into Bracteatum the same with Helichrysum bicolor Helichrysum acuminatum Helichrysum papillosum Helichrysum banksii and Helichrysum macrocephalum Bentham didn't care. He said, they're all going in there. It's, 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 uh, it's just a widespread and morphologically variable species. And that remained the case for almost 100 years um, in Australia. And um, uh, over that time, then Australian botanists, perhaps with a better knowledge of the flora and a lot more field work, more collections, better specimens, uh, began to recognise and reinstate uh, things like viscosum, bicolor, acuminatum, papillosum. But Banksii and macrocephalum remained uh, as synonyms of, uh, of Helichrysum bracteatum and then obviously Bracteantha and Xerochrysum bracteatum. Um, they're both described um, by um, De Candolf from collections of Alan Cunningham. Um, and um, they were, they were sort of quite enigmatic things in this project, but I really wanted to track these things down and, and try to work them out. Bruce Wannan had, um, had, had collected Xerochrysum near Cooktown. You can sort of see it in the foreground here of this photo and then scattered through this grassy headland. And, and certainly initially it was like, oh, well, that, that looks just like, um, you know, Xerochrysum North Stradbroke Island on, on a grassy headland by the sea all the way up the east coast to as far north as Cooktown. Um, you may not be aware, but Cooktown is so named because in um, 1770, when uh, uh, Captain James Cook uh, was, uh, was um, 
surveying the east coast of Australia for the British with the botanists um, Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. They, uh, they almost uh, sank their ship, the Endeavour, on the Great Barrier Reef near Cooktown, which is north of Cairns. Um, so right up in the in the tropics of northern Australia, the ship almost sank. They managed to get it onto the beach at the Endeavour River, and they spent, uh, I think it was six weeks, um, might be three months, certainly a, a good deal of time at the Endeavour River repairing the boat, <clears throat> and um, would have been happy times for Joseph Banks and Daniel Solander. They made a large number of collections there, including. Um, uh, a xerochrysum in 1770 from from the from the, uh, the the grassy heights above the Endeavour River, and uh, Alan Cunningham went back there and recollected it. Uh, I think in 18, 1826, and um, and he described it as Helichrysum banksii. But Bentham didn't agree. He also didn't agree with Cunningham's assessment of macrocephalum on the sandy shores of Moreton Bay which I was able to return to. And so these, these were things that I really wanted to, to try to work out and try to unravel uh, the, uh, the taxonomy of these things. Um, in the past, you know, botanists have really relied upon a morphology, but um, I, I really wanted to, to go down the path of molecular work. And obviously my supervisors were <laughs> in total agreement. Um, I had used, uh, genotyping by sequencing in my honours project. Um, but for the PhD, rather than doing um, sort of a double digest RAD um, approach uh, with lots of lab work and pipetting and extractions and stuff, we went down the, the path of using uh, what's called DART sequencing or DART seq by diversity arrays, uh, an Australian company based here in Canberra in Australia. Um, you can see there it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a form of um, rad sequencing, but uh, I think they've they've modified it particularly to, to sort of target unmethylated restriction sites, and this really helps um, deal with issues related to polyploidy, and um, it's also suitable for organisms lacking a reference genome. Um, we we were wondering whether we'd be able to. Um, use a reference genome and um, the closest thing that we could we th thought we had for this was was really was um, helianthus was um, was sunflowers so um, not even in the failure but um, potentially uh, to be used as a reference genome um, as it was we used the dart seek approach it doesn't require a reference genome and um, I'm really happy to say that it worked it worked really well um, so one of the um, the first or well, the first paper that came out of my project um, was was examining um, the the origins of uh, of the colourful uh, hybrid cultivars that we that, that are grown around the world. So as I mentioned, you know um, these things were first grown in Europe um, at the sort of the end of the 1700s and the early 1800s, um, and so. We, we wrote a paper that's, uh, uh, you know, that was looking at um, the, the hist history of, of the cultivation of these things and, and also testing um, some of the assumptions about the origins of the colourful hybrids. So they're, they're widely grown around the world um, in, in colours ranging from white all the way through, you know, the typical yellows in pale yellows, dark yellows, golden yellows, burnt oranges, pinks, reds, purples. Um, and for a long time, uh, certainly in Australia, it was, it was thought that these were the result of crosses made in the 1800s in Europe between um, Australian xerochrysum or helichrysum as they were then and, and South African helichrysum because you know, South African helichrysums have got a huge range of colors, um, spectacular colors. And uh, if, you're, if you're working under the assumption that they're all in the genus Helichrysum, it, it seems reasonable um, to, to do um, interspecific hybridization within the genus and, and get um, lots of wonderful uh, uh, colors um, transferred into the, into the, uh, into Xerochrysum bracteatum. But 
as we now know, um, the, the phylogeny is actually a bit more complicated than that, and Australian nephalia are in, uh, largely endemic uh, to Australia um, and, and are, are actually quite distant, uh, uh, distantly related to helichrysum. And so the potential for a successful hybridization event between xerochrysum and uh, North African Southern European helichrysum or, or seems, seems quite remote. Um, we decided to test that using the molecular data. <clears throat> um, you can sort of see here, we've got the, uh, the xerochrysum from, again, this is the, that, that plant that I grew from seed from St. Helena. We've got a, a cultivar that I collected uh, from the National Botanic Gardens here in Australia. And here we've got the buds of, of uh, West Australian um, xerochrysum macranthum. We, 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 we looked at the uh, the species that were being um, that had been published that, that were known to be grown in Europe um, during the time when the colourful cultivars were produced, and we looked for evidence of gene flow between uh, uh, any of those other species and uh, and Xerochrysum bracteatum, and <clears throat> what we were able to to find was that. Um, we could uh, detect um, gene flow between uh, Xerochrysum macranthum, which, which has white filaries, uh, white and pink filaries, and it grows in Western Australia. Um, and we could see gene flow between the populations there and the cultivars, but not between those populations and what's growing on St. Hain St. Helena Island or any of the other locations I collected it in New South Wales. Um, we were also able to see uh, using um, a structure analysis that the cultivars showed uh, a proportion of uh, ancestry of xerochrysum macranthum that wasn't, that wasn't detected in the St. Helena samples or any of these other wild populations in New South Wales or in viscose or in xerochrysum bicolor. And we also used these uh, D statistics to do a ABBA BABA analysis um, and and um, and showed that the uh, that there was a, a significant proportion of, of gene flow from macranthum um, to the to the cultivars. Um, so that was really really nice to get that paper done um, during the course of the PhD um, and to and to draw out some of the history of of, of the of these things and and and. And to um, to put some um, empirical data and behind you know a uh, a long held but but found to be false thing that uh, these things are uh, hybrids with with uh, African species. So I used the molecular data, um, visualized it using a principal coordinates analysis. So this is all of my samples of xerochrysum. And they, 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 they showed that there was a number of clusters. Again, this is all going to be, um, going to be published shortly in Australian Systematic Botany. Um, but what uh, we can sort of see here was that, you know, that West Australian xerochrysum macranthum, an annual on the coastal plain, um, was really clustering differently to, to perennial species on mountaintops um, within the bracteatum group, as I called it. There's a number of clusters and I was able to sort of go in deeper and explore these um, in more detail. I also used uh, structure extensively to look for um, evidence of shared ancestry between these things. And I'd sort of do a, a larger group of, of structure uh, of samples in a structure analysis and then and then focus in on on more uh, to get more detail on some of the groups that that didn't seem to be uh, well explained in the larger in the larger um, analyses. So here <clears throat> we on the right hand side we've got four um, phrase name entities that I was exploring in this in this bracteatum group over here. So we've got bracteatum in the strict sense, including the cultivars in <clears throat> St. Helena Island. And we're comparing their ancestry to things like this um, Xerochrysum split New England, um, and then um, the Barrington, and then uh, Point Lookout, which is right down here at the bottom. Um, and um, 
And using this multiple lines of evidence, we were able to sort of show um, molecular differences and differences in ancestry between a number of the different things. But we were also show, able to show similarities. So for example, here, uh, Xerochrysum bicolor, which has been <coughs> named um, a named species for a number of years, was, um, was shown to be um, uh, very similar to Xerochrysum helmaturorum, recently described by Paul uh, Paul Wilson, and also something that I picked up at Lofty Ranges, um, which is on the, the mainland of, of South Australia, and I'd gone, oh, what's this? And then the molecular data showed, well, actually, they're largely all the same thing. Um, we did a, took a similar approach with the genus Coronidium um, and found that, um, you know, th there were not quite as many of these uh, phrase name species, but, but certainly some that really jumped out. This Coronidium many peaks was one. Um, and then a whole lot of complexity that we really uh, grappled with. This, this, uh, this work will be published hopefully later this year uh, when I get around to it. Um, and, um, and yeah, looking forward to publishing a number of new species in, in Coronidium as well. Um, <clears throat> One of the approaches, or well, the, the way we, we approached this was to, to sort of look for, uh, use the molecular data to, to show uh, groups of things, things that were similar and things that were different. And then we, we went looking for uh, morphological differences that would, um, would enable us to diagnose these things in the field and on herbarium specimens. And we found that, um, that indumentum vari variation was really big amongst species and entities in, of xerochrysum. On this image here, um, you can see um, uh, the, um, let's get my pointer here, that on A and D, so this is the adaxial surface and abaxial surface. Um, this is um, what you might, what we were calling xerochrysum bracteatum in the sen strict sense. Um, it's got a very sparse indumentum on ad, uh, adaxially and on the abaxial surface it's just got tiny little uh, little glands whereas um, you know what's currently included in as the same species from from Barrington tops which is a area of high endemism had really quite different um, obviously different um, uh, trichomes and um, as well as uh, glandular hairs. And then um, this thing at point lookout, which is, you know, when you look at it, it's very hairy looking thing. Um, the, the images clearly show, you know, a number of different hairs. We've got septate hairs, and then we've also got these little glandular hairs uh, lying uh, beneath as well. So indumentum we found to be uh, a, a really uh, informative way to tell these, these things apart. Um, so going back here to um, the cladogram from Schmidt Laboon et al. Um, <clears throat> and, and my study group, I've just grayed out the other parts. Um, we, we were able to use the, the, uh, the DART-seq SNP data to, to uh, infer uh, phylogenies. And we can see here um, my, my study group. Um, I've, I've put some red, uh, I've put some colored bars here so that we can easily relate it to the Schmidt, uh, the Schmidt Laboon et al phylogeny. So um, the great thing about this was that um, the, the phylogeny with um, much greater sampling um, from a completely different data set, you know, we're using SNPs, whereas um, these were um, um, <laughs> um, plastered regions, um, of, of the genome for um, and, and a um, Sanger sequencing for Schmidt Laboon at all um, was that um, was that we got largely the same uh, uh, phy phylogeny. So we've got um, we've got uh, the xerochrysum here in red. Then we've got an elatum group one in green, um, an oxylepus group in blue, and elatum group two. Um, so forming a very similar st structure, um, reinforcing um, the results of schmidt Labuna and giving us greater confidence in this, in this SNP phylogeny. Interestingly, um, our outgroup taxa Acoma Sacoma was coming out as, as sister to this Coronidium elatum group two, um, not with great um, bootstrap support, but 
um, nonetheless um, interesting result. And I, I understand that more research will be undertaken shortly on um, trying to understand that group. Um, so yeah, so uh, you have 5,000 snips, a million random quartets and a thousand bootstrap replicates um, gave us this tree. And um, I was then able to uh, take morphological um, uh, details and, and, and map those onto the phylogeny to, to start to understand where perhaps we might be able to draw lines around groups and call them genera. Um, these uh, morphological characters were, um, were largely taken from the work of Paul Wilson, but um, were um, also, um, we also came up with some of these ourselves. And we can see that the, the you know, zero chrysum hangs together really well. The Coronidium elatum group too has, has got some um, unique identifiers um, that make it different from this oxalipus group. I'm just looking at the time and going, I've been talking a lot and need to hurry along. So uh, from, uh, from this work, uh, we've got a paper, um, it's been accepted for publication in Taxon. And um, in that paper, we will be describing what has previously been known as the Coronidium malatum group one as a new genus, uh, Leucosoma T.L. Collins. We can see here, um, we were sort of discussing, you know, uh, perhaps to make the, these monophyletic, we, we lump um, the, you know, these oxalipus group, the elatum group and xerochrysum together into a, an expanded xerochrysum. Um, that would have resulted in, um, in effectively all of these coronidium species becoming, uh, having their names changed to, to xerochrysum. Um, I, I thought a more sort of parsimonious approach would be to um, describe a new genus to, to uh, uh, leucosoma, it means a, a limited number of name changes. It also recognizes that there are quite distinct uh, morphological differences between these groups um, outlined here on the phylogeny and, um, and, um, and, and yeah, it keeps the number of name changes to the minimum. Um, we, we were able to take advantage of all these live plants that I'd grown um, to do some flow cytometry and look for polyploidy. Um, this is uh, something that Alexander has um, some experience with. And so it was really great to work with him in the lab here in Canberra and, um, and explore uh, genome sizes in xerochrysum. So effectively, it's a, it's a rapid sampling approach to, to, to uh, determine genome size. So we have a, a known standard uh, and at the same on the same mix, you run, you run your own known sample. And from those, you can calculate approximate genome sizes. And, and in, the, in, in the very first day of doing it, we were looking at this um, Brachtiatum sample from near Armadale. And then we looked at one from a little bit further north, um, also on the Northern Tablelands at Guy Fawkes River National Park. And we were like, oh, that's a bit weird. We couldn't find the sample. And then we changed the X axis and we were like, wow, there it is. It's right out there. It um, it's, uh, appears to be a hexaploid. So um, on the very first day, we were able to start finding polyploidies. But what we also did find was that xerochrysum has a relatively large genome. Um, and um, we were then able to use the material, the live plants to, um, to do root squashes and chromosome counts to um, confirm uh, these uh, instances of polyploidy. Um, using that flow cytometry and genome size, I then um, uh, map that onto a, uh, a phylogeny of xerochrysum to try to understand whether there were clades that, you know, polyploid clades. Um, effectively, the results um, show that um, polyploidy has occurred multiple times across uh, the genus, and, and there don't appear to be any uh, specific polyploid clades. Uh, we found that the genus is mostly uh, diploid, but there are a number of tetraploids and also um, hexaploid populations. Um, really interesting, some of these things, this, this one, that Henry River, the hexaploid that was on the previous slide, um, it's morphologically it appears to be this new species, Xerochrysum coplandii, um, but um, 
but uh, the molecular data and a structure analysis suggests it's actually an, a natural uh, hybrid and a hexaploid. Um, and the, um, this is sort of borne out with the um, phylogeny that places it here in, uh, in the viscosum samples, unlike its, um, uh, its diploid uh, cousin, cousin, sister, I don't know, um, uh, which, um, which is, in a, is in a different clade entirely. Um, rattling along, uh, yeah, there's um, perhaps a little bit um, under under resolution, but some pictures there of some um, chromosomes in xerochrism. Um, uh, we've got uh, A and B, uh, xerochrism viscosum. We've got a tetraploid and a hexaploid. Um, I, I never was able to get a really nice squash of a uh, of a hexaploid cell so you could get a definitive count on chromosomes, but um, needless to say, it's pretty crowded in there. And then um, as well, um, a, a species we're describing, a new species we're describing from Barrington Tops, which has um, diploid populations and tetraploid populations, um, and also has morphological differences. We can see here, so, uh, we have um, populations of yellow fillaries with relatively small chromosomes, oh, it's chromosomes, cotyledons, um, and, um, and the leaves abaxially have these large uh, septate ha hairs, trichomes. The white tetraploids, um, much larger um, cotyledons, and uh, glabrous or almost glabrous abax abaxially. Uh, we are looking in a future paper to describe that as a distinct species um, due to the fact that it's uh, morphologically diagnosable and uh, polyploidy um, has instituted a barrier to gene flow. Uh, so uh, recognizing it as a separately evolving entity. Um, just to wrap up, really um, wonderful supervisors, Professor Jeremy Brule here on the left, Alexander, who's just um, heaps of fun to be around. Um, Rose Andrew and um, Ian Telford. Um, you'd never get a better breakfast in the field than um, Ian's um, huavos rancheros. Um, look, they, I really um, had such such a good time with all these people, um, and great appreciation for the efforts they made for me. Um, here's a table um, with um, a bunch of new species and the phrase names. It, it won't really mean much to an international audience, but um, this work, as I said, will be will be uh, coming out soon in Australian Systematic Botany. Um, sadly, that Xerochrysum split North Stradbroke Island, so distinctive morphologically, but something happened uh, with the molecular data. We weren't able to really conclusively nail it. Um, so we've got to run a few more samples and do a bit more research there. Also with uh, Xerochrysum split Blackfellows Gap, We'd like to uh, try to resolve that one too. But otherwise, um, yeah, lots of new names. Um, a, a key to species on, based on their morphology um, and um, huge amount of support from around the world, herbaria, project funding, um, Aboriginal ranger groups, um, partners, friends, um, people I'd never met before. It was wonderful and um, yeah. Thank you very much for the time to present this. Thank you so much, Sam. Those images were amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Um, look, sorry. I hope it didn't drag on too long. No, you're. It's just you. You got. You got the whole time. Um, right. So we can have time for questions. Uh, you can. Um, yep. Put them in the chat, and I can ask them. Uh, but if you want, you can also unmute yourself. So we already have one from um, Ed Schilling. So he says, what impact does inclusion of polyploids have on phylogenetic resolution using genotype by sequencing? Great question. Yeah, I, I know this, this came up at a conference and, um, and was something that the people were like, oh, you can't, you can't do uh, you know, uh, genotyping by sequencing with polyploids. It, it, it creates all sorts of problems. Um, look, um, the the dart seek um, method was was developed um, specifically to to deal with uh, with polyploids in I think in wheat was one of their um, their sort of their initial um, 
publications. And um, my understanding and is that the uh, that that um, methylation sensitive approach and also their their post uh, post sequencing processing of, of the of the data is how they they uh, overcome the the issues with polyploidy, and certainly um, the um, the um, the results that I got didn't seem to suggest that that there, there wasn't any sort of crazy results. The the results were seemed to to con to uh, I'm trying to find the right words here. The results seemed to support um, what we thought and seemed to place things together, polyploids and diploids together, not not apart. So um, hopefully that provides something of an answer for you, Ed. Yeah, he's also got a, a quick follow up. Did you rerun with the diploids only? Uh, no, um, in terms of no, but that's a good question. And, and um, I guess it's something that we didn't think of. Um, but yeah, I'll, uh, I, I can, I'll have a think a bit more of a think about that. Thanks for raising that Ed. Cool. And Alexander, do you have your hand up? Or are you going to ask a question? Uh, no, I just wanted to uh, comment on, on the polyploid issue. So I just wanted to clarify that if you uh, remember what Tim presented about the polyploidy, um, it seems as if, although there's a few hybrids, it seems as if mostly, you know, the polyploids are happening at the tips. So I just wanted to clarify, uh, Tim did not find that there was any, you know, like uh, tetraploid clade or something like that. So there was no reason to assume that there was some kind of, you know, hybrid ancestry that would mess up the phylogeny, if, if that makes sense. Great. And then we have a question from Isaac, who says, amazing work. What was the relationship of the zero Chrysomborial group found in the tropical northern area to the rest of the group? And what do you think was the order of ecological transitions into arid zones? Okay. Um, well, look, um, in terms of that um, biophysical barrier of the sandstone plateaus in Arnhem Land, the, we, we found that there was um, there was some evidence of uh, of uh, Restricted gene flow, but but certainly no evidence that this had led to um, speciation. So, um, in terms of the uh, the molecular data, the principal coordinates analysis saw, saw these things clustering together. But then, in terms of um, structure analyses, it showed that there were some uh, dist di distinct differences. But then, when it came down to morphology, we weren't able to to um, find any morphological features on on the specimens or the or the live plants that um, enabled them to be um, separated. And so, under our sort of our species concept, we 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 kept them as a single species, um, which has a you know disjunct. Uh, distribution. Um, the second part of the question is to do with the arid zone, is that right? Um, I, my study didn't really um, try to come to, to terms with, um, with um, radiations and, and their sources or anything like that. Um, Alexander, do you have any um, opinion on, on that? I know you've done some work of on um, leukochrysum and its and its origins, but what about xerochrysum? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, so uh, you didn't. Uh, we didn't do a formal um, ancestral range analysis or something like that as part of the work, but um, just eyeballing the phylogeny, um, you know, you see that the. I hesitate to use that term because a lot of people hate it, you know, basal, <laughs> uh, the, you know, the, the, the first, you know, if you read from the root, basically, uh, it, it seems to me as if Xerocrysum would have come out of the temperate east, maybe even southeast. So, I mean, uh, you know, Tasmania and uh, the temperate east of Australia. So, uh, that's all I think I can say. We haven't really done anything that would look more closely at, at individual movements in the individual clades, but it seems to me as if it comes from there and then would have diversified into the arid parts. Mm. Yeah, so certainly the clade which contains sort of the alpine species um, was, was you know, as Alexander said, perhaps, you know, more basal to, to the arid zone stuff. Let's see, Nicola, do you want to have a question? 
Yeah, so um, thanks very much, Tim, for a really interesting talk. And uh, it was just amazing seeing the images of the plants and, and their habitats. Um, and, you know, and of course, comparing it to the Nefeli that I know from Southern Africa, it's, it's quite intriguing. Um, I've never actually been to Australia, but I'd love to come and have a look at the, the plants there. Um, and what actually struck me in quite a few of your pictures was growth form differences in, in, these, in these plants. And I know that that's something that's so difficult to use taxonomically because it's so difficult to quantify. But um, there were things like basal leaves and different branching, different orientation of bracts even, although that's not really growth form and um, things like that. So I just wondered about those kind of differences in all the species that you're recognizing and whether you were able to to quantify those differences? Yeah, uh, look, um, it's a great question. And certainly quantifying them is, is the challenge, I suppose. We we didn't attempt to quantify them, uh, you know, to, to score them in any way and create, you know, turn them into, um, into um, continuous variables or data or that sort of stuff. Um, because although I certainly did think about it and, and certainly, um, in terms of the, their their habit, but but growing them um, sort of in a sort of a common garden or common glasshouse experiment um, was was a way that we we used to um, to set our minds at ease at least that um, that um, that that um, morphology in terms of their habit that we we observed in the field um, was something that that wasn't just a, an environmental environmentally induced um, result it, it was it was more to do with uh, with the genetics rather than just the environment and so we, we grew we grew these things in in the glass house side by side and so certainly that one that we grew that from um, that Cunningham described as as helichrys and banksii from up at Cooktown is is grows on the on the headlands and it's actually rather than just being a little compact sort of bouquet type thing it's it's a it's a prostrate plant that that grows along the ground and that and that was um, clearly um, seen in in the glasshouse and and compared to um, things that were growing on the Atherton table and just you know 50 kilometers away um, which um, were, were completely different so yeah um, the other thing that I wanted to try to um, come to grips with was, you know, these the arrangement of the fillories on the capitula because they 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 looking at them they seem to be um, some real differences there. But I wasn't able to really um, come up with a with a way that satisfied myself that we weren't just um, you know grasping at um, individual variation. It, it seemed to be quite a a tricky thing you know there um you know people were like saying oh just compare you know the shape of one fillery to another and it's like well which fillery are you going to choose you know they're they're arranged in a in so in a um a spiraling sort of pattern and and um it's not just a simple case of like choosing oh yeah we're going to choose the third one it, there, there, it wasn't a, a simple uh task so um that was why we we really focused in on um on the uh, indumentum and um, as well as, um, as, as things like, um, you know, um, leaf size, um, the things that we could much more readily um, measure on, on specimens. Yeah. Great, are there any other questions for Tim? Okay, well, I will thank you again um, for waking up super early or staying up super late, either way, however you did it, um, to join us at this time. Um, we appreciate it. And this uh, talk has been recorded, so it'll go up on our, our um, YouTube page. I also have just a couple of few announcements. I posted the link to our, our journal, um, the Composite Newsletter or Capitulum there. You can see that. Um, so please consider reading it, sharing it and submitting. Uh, I'm also just throwing in a plug for this conference we had a couple weeks ago that was online for plant genomes and all of the recordings are, are being put up onto YouTube. 
Uh, and then finally, one more announcement. Um, the, the last link there is for a compositing morphology workshop that will happen post botany conference. So it's a two day workshop and then there's a day um, field trip out and into the Alaskan wild to look at comps. So if you're planning to go to botany or you have friends who are going, please share the, the information with them. Um, and if there are any other announcements, um, you can feel free to unmute and let us know. Shameless plugs are fine. <laughs> um, otherwise, I just thank everybody. Thank Tim one more time. And I hope that everyone has a great week. Awesome. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Thanks Tim. Bye. Yeah, thank you. Good night. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Oregon. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.